Hello, and this morning we'll be discussing the developmental biology of the zebra fish as part of your course IB6213, Techniques in Molecular Biology 2. There are two model organisms which have been referenced in molecular biology for studying the vertebrate model. In the previous lecture, I have shown you the nematode model, which is an invertebrate model, and the Danio radio and Oriza latipes are two vertebrate models which are utilized to study molecular mechanisms in vertebrates. Now, Danio radio is referred to as a zebra fish, and Oriza latipes is re referred to as the Medeca fish. Both of these Organisms have a very small genome as compared to other vertebrates, and their life cycle is very short, which makes them ideal for utilization in laboratory settings. Now, when we look at model organisms, we have to consider different factors. The first factor is basically the fecundity. So fecundity refers to the ability of a fish to produce a lot of spawn and eggs. And this fecundity is regulated by light in the case of zebra fish. Now, we require the fish to produce more eggs because we utilize them for studies involving mutation as well as gene knockouts. And we need to generate new progeny at a fairly high rate. Now, one of the aspects of developmental biology with zebra fish is that microinjection is relatively easy because the eggs can be viewed under an optical microscope and the embryos are transparent. So this allows us to study the development of the zebra fish using a conventional optical microscope. And the fish do not have to be sacrificed as the embryos can be retrieved from the observation screen, which is generally a petri plate or a glass slide, and then reintroduce into the tank to continue their developmental cycle. Now, the genome size is approximately 20 to 40% the size of the mammalian genome. And these genomes can be mutated very easily in addition, this model of organism has a maturation time of only two to three months, and this reduces the cycle time for generating transgenic lines. So zebra fish and medeca fish are basically excellent animal systems to study vertebrate molecular biology. Now, the medeca fish is basically a model which has been developed by Japanese researchers, and it has been studied extensively in Japan. Now, when we study developmental mo molecular biology, we basically look at the relationship between the structure and the function of genes. And we have two basic principles, reverse genetics and forward genetics. In reverse genetics, we look at developmental cues and we observe these cues by knocking out specific genes or specific transcripts and characterizing the altered phenotypes. So what this implies or what this means is that a researcher will basically look at a set of genes, assuming that the genome has been fully sequenced, and he will then knock out specific genes and look for the changes in the phenotype. In the case of forward genetics, we look at the phenotype first uh, for unique patterns of development and correlate them to their associated genes. So both reverse genetics and forward genetics are important tools utilized in molecular biology and developmental biology. In today's lecture, I will introduce you to the zebra fish Dinia radio as a model organism. I will elaborate upon techniques associated with the manipulation of zebra fish in the laboratory, and I will discuss the experimental design using zebra fish as a model organism. The learning outcomes for today's lecture are as follows. You should be able to 
demonstrate an understanding of the terminology and techniques associated with zebrafish. And you should be able to design experiments using zebrafish as a model organism. Now, the reason for these two learning outcomes is the fact that a large number of laboratories utilize zebrafish as a model for pharmaceutical testing, as well as for genetic experiments. And as a molecular biologist, you are expected to know about the techniques associated with the management of zebrafish. Now, why do we select a model organism? As with most other model organisms, this is basically related to convenience as well as the time for conducting experiments. So zebrafish are amenable to culture in the laboratory. They have short life cycle. They produce a large number of eggs. Their embryos are transparent and can be manipulated in vitro. The genome has been sequenced and they share homologs with the human genome. There's a network of zebrafish laboratories and they share this information via the ZFIN network. And you have thousands of publications and databases as well as purebred lines, which have specific genes that have been knocked out. So all of this gives you an advantage in terms of the study of zebrafish. Now the life cycle of Dinorio is basically spread over a period of six months. So this is very convenient for laboratory research. So you begin with the adult and the eggs hatch in about one hour. And they then produce, they go through these developmental stages for four days, three weeks, six, four weeks, and finally at three months, they attain maturity. And at this age, they generally produce eggs. So these are the developmental stages. So after fertilization, developmental processes begin. So after 30 minutes, you will have the development of the primary split in the cell type. And then you will have the second phase, which involves the cleavage. Then you have the gastrulation and the formation of the gut, followed by the formation of the organs at organogenesis. And finally, you have the hatching once the body parts form. And then you have this oil globule. This basically serves as a nutritive source, a source of nutrition for the fish prior to it developing the gut and the mouth parts. And finally, you have the adult. So this process of development is essential in order to study the processes involved in gene replication in fish. For instance, at this stage, you can select the eggs and you can view them under the microscope at different stages and introduce them back into the tank or into the water to continue the development. There is no need to sacrifice the fish at any point in time. So this makes it ideal for in vivo studies as well as in vitro studies. Now, zebrafish embryos are basically transparent and develop rapidly outside the mother. So they can be basically observed. And adult fishes produce at least 200 eggs per week. And this enables researchers to cover, collect a large number of eggs for statistical analysis. And you can basically conduct chemical manipulations by diluting the compound, in this case, the mutagen, in water. And then you can raise the embryos in this particular chemical re reagent. Now, this has formed the basis for many studies involving toxicity and compounds which are toxic to Vertebrates can be tested using the zebrafish model. We will go through the different stages of development in detail. So the first stage is basically the zygote formation in which you have fertilization, following which you have the one cell stage and the two cell stage. You then go into the cleavage phase. So you have the four cell, eight cell, 16 cell, and so on until you have the 64 cell stage. Following this, you have the formation of the blastula, blastula. So you'll have the 128 cell stage until the 2000 cell stage. And this results in the formation of the blastula. Then you have the formation of the gastrula or the gut tube. So the gastrula refers to the intestine, the stomach, as well as the 
different components involved in the gut formation. So you have the epibody formation, then you have the tail bud formation, which shows the primordial tail. And finally, you have the somites, which show the basic structure of the vertebral column. Finally, you have the segmentation period in which the somites basically are revealed. So somites basically show the segmentation of the vertebral column as the development progresses. The pharyngula period is basically the stage at which the fish has formed the primordial body structure. You can view the heart. At this stage, if you view the zebra fish under the microscope, you will actually observe the beating of the heart. And this is basically the oil body, which will provide the fish with a certain amount of lipid, which it will consume during the first phase of its basic hatching period. And during hatching, you will see that at the 48th hour, there is this oil body. The fish will consume this oil uh, for as, as a source of nutri nutrition and energy. And once this oil has been consumed, basically the gut develops and you have a primordial mouth forming and then you the fish will start feeding. So this is a critical time in the development of the fish as any infection by bacteria or fungus can impair the development of the feeding parts, which are the mouth and the primordial gut. So this is the uh, picture of the larvae and how it looks. Now we look at specific breeding terminologies which are used when we speak of zebra fish. And these breeding terminologies are also used in classical breeding studies. And you as a researcher should be aware of these breeding terminologies because they are referenced in literature and will form part of your research work in the future. Now the word dam, D-A-M, refers to a female fish the sire, S-I-R-E, refers to the male fish. Now, the word dam and sire are used when we are conducting an experiment involving crossbreeding. The wild type basically refers to the original genotype or the phenotype, which is derived from the wild. The recruit refers to an individual introduced into a breeding system with the objective of introducing specific traits. Now, for instance, if you have a dam and a sire, you will, have, you will cross them and you will obtain a pure bred population because you know the source of the dam and the sire. But suppose you cross these progeny from the dam and sire with a wild type or with a recruit, the subsequent progeny or generation F2 will, will basically acquire the traits from the wild type and the recruit. So these are things which can be done during the process of developing a isogenic or a pure cell line. We also have what is known as the term SIB. So SIB are basically individuals derived from the same parent. So when you cross a dam and a sire, the progeny of that is called a SIB. And the half SIB basically refers to individuals who have one parent in common. So in this case, you may have two females or two dams and one sire, and then you will have half SIBs, which basically means that they're half siblings. So these are some of the terms which you should remember throughout the course of your study when you conduct research involving zebra fish as researchers or publications will refer to these terms in general literature. So you can utilize half sieves in breeding experiments by introducing specific genes. Let us look at how this is done in the future slides. But before that, we will basically look at how the breeding is conducted in the laboratory. And breeding basically involves the fertilization in the laboratory. Now, when we conduct experiments involving zebra fish, we basically utilize light as a cue because light induces breeding in zebra fish. So what we do is we select mature adults, which are five months and older. And the way you identify the female and the male is basically by looking at the body shape from above. So you look from the, at the fish tank from above, and the females will have a slightly enlarged belly, indicating that they are fecund or fertile, and the males are generally slender. That's basically how you identify fish for breeding. So you select mature adults, 
And then you have to do a process known as acclimatization in holding tanks. Now, this process involves maintaining the fish at a constant temperature and with a photo period that is generally 12 hours of light and 12 hours of darkness. We maintain this photo period because any change in the photo period will induce spawning and breeding in the fish. Now, after we hold them in tanks for a duration of time, we introduce the male and females in a ratio of two is to one in the breeding tank with separators in between. The reason why we introduce this separator in between the male and the female is to prevent fertilization prior to the actual experiment. So the male and female are basically in a tank with a separator in the, in the middle, and they are basically maintained in darkness for 16 hours. So for some reason, darkness generally reduces their metabolism, and that basically turns on their cycle when the light is introduced. So this generally replicates what happens in nature, because in nature, the fish breeding follows the lunar cycle. So if there's a darkness followed by a sudden introduction of, for instance, the light, which is representative of the full moon, they will release the gametes and then fertilization occurs. Now, once fertilization occurs, it is very important to separate the adults from the eggs because the adults will consume the eggs. And once the adults are separated, the eggs are then transferred into a fresh tank with the same water at the same pH and the same electrical conductivity. This is very important because the eggs will get shocked if you transfer them into a water at a different temperature, a different pH, or a different electrical conductivity. So we basically tend to utilize the same type or the same tank of water for all the experiments. And once they're in the water, the eggs will hatch. You will have to introduce a agent, which is antibacterial, such as methylene blue, to prevent the growth of fungi on the eggs themselves. So all of these experiments have to be conducted in a clean facility, not necessarily sterile water, but it's a good practice to utilize water which has been sterilized previously or has been treated with UV radiation. So this is basically what is done in the lab. So this is a view of the breeding tank. And in this case, the breeding tank is, this is a separator. This is a separator of the fish. So the fish will basically breed and the eggs will fall below this net and the eggs are collected in this lower cavity over here. So that's basically what happens during the breeding experiment. Now we move on to the zebrafish genome. So the zebrafish genome has a size of 1412 gigabases and 25 chromosomes. And the reference genome is called Tobingen. It's a German lab which has developed or basically sequenced the genome. And there is a high level of heterozygosity and variation within different strains. So about 71% of the 20,000 odd protein coding genes in Homo sapiens have autologs in the zebrafish genome and 69% of the 26,000 odd protein coding zebrafish genes have human counterparts. Now this makes it very easy to compare the gene expression in humans as well as zebrafish as there are orthologs between the, the two species. And this also makes it easy to study certain developmental aspects as the gene expression patterns will be similar in both these two species. Now, there are 4,556 RNA genes, including microRNAs. So because of the fact that zebrafish genes are similar to the human genes in terms of their disease genes, and as they are listed in the OMIM, or the on Online Mendelian Inheritance in Man database, you can utilize them as a good source of reference material for studying human disease. Now, researchers generally study zebrafish in terms of mutations. And in order to do this, the eggs are exposed to the mutagenic agent. It is relatively easy to do this with zebrafish, as the mutagenic agent can be diluted 
in the tank water itself at various concentrations. And the lethal concentrations and the sublethal concentrations can be determined. Now, there is an agent. So NENU, which is ethyl nitrosourea, is an alkylating agent that modifies single DNA bases, resulting in randomly distributed point mutations. Now, when you have a point mutation in a particular gene, the open reading frame will basically get disrupted and there will be a nonsense mutation and a protein truncation of that particular gene encoded protein. So now these mutations can be studied for their effect on the phenotype. So this is the way in which you utilize a mutagen to carry out random mutations and then look at the phenotypical expression of that particular mutation. Now, generally, mutations which are lethal are those which involve the cell developmental cycle or which are involved in the early developmental phases. Now, please remember that when you utilize an uh, alkylating agent, the mutation is random. You have no control over the target of that particular agent. However, you can control the frequency by controlling the concentration of the mutagenic agent. OK, so this is what is done generally. You have the female and the male fish. So you have the dam and the sire. So this is the dam, and this is the sire. So you have the crossover of the dam and the sire, and then you produce the F1 generation. The F1 generation will have heterozygous and homozygous. And from this, you produce the F2 generation, and you screen the embryos for that particular trait. For instance, if I'm looking at a trait involving neurological development, I will mutate the fish, I will mutate the female, the dam, uh, and I will, or I will mutate the male fish or the female fish, as the case may be, and I will cross it over with the unmutated male or female, and the progeny are then analyzed for the distribution of those mutations. And this analysis can be done via genome sequencing or via transcript analysis. And we look for the embryos for that particular expression pattern, both in terms of genotype as well as phenotype. And this continues for up to three or more generations. Now, the reason why we look for different generations is because we are testing the stability of that particular mutation as it occurs across generations. So when we want to generate mutations in zebrafish, we can utilize randomly mutagenized sperm. So we basically have males which have sperm that are mutagenized, and we basically cross them over with females which are non non-treated. And these descendants carry mutations. And the first element of screening involves looking at the developmental phases using the stereo microscopes. And this is why you need to have a good knowledge of the basic morphology of development. As I have indicated to you, you should know about the gastrulation, the blastulation, because when you look through the microscope, you can basically look for the mutations in terms of the phenotype. So once you have identified the phenotypes, you can then look back at the genotype by conducting a PCR followed by sequencing of the target genes. So because they, these genes have orthologs in the human genome, for instance, you can find mutations related to cardiovascular disease, and you can link, link them back to the human genes representing the respective orthologs. Now, one of the procedures which is utilized to study mutations in zebrafish is a process known as TILLING, T-I-L-L-I-N-G, which is an acronym for the Targeting Induced Local Lesions in Genomes. So this basically involves comparison of the DNA from the wild type with the DNA from the mutant. Now, how this is done is very simple. So you have your wild type fish, 
and you have your mutant fish. Okay, now the mutant fish has been generated by treating it with a certain chemical compound, such as the alkylating agent I just mentioned. And after you basically extract the DNA from both these fish, you then you do something known as hybridization. So you mix both the DNA in a tube, maybe a PCR tube, and then you do something known as hybridization. This involves heating and cooling of the DNA. So the DNA will basically get heated, it'll denature, and then when you cool, it'll anneal back to its native state. Now, what will happen is that there will be an interaction between the DNA from the mutant and the DNA from the wild type. And wherever there is a mismatch, you can utilize a cell nuclease, a special nuclease, which will cleave point mutations. Following this, you can carry out gel electrophoresis and mapping. Let us look at this in the following diagram. So basically what you have is you have to extract your DNA from both the fish. You have the WT is the wild type and mutated is the mutant fish which has been mutated using the alkylating agent. So after this is done, you then have to combine both of this DNA or the PCR product. In this case, we have utilized a PCR product. So we carry out a PCR of one gene from the wild type and the corresponding homologue in the mutated or mutant type. And these two DNA molecules, these two PCR molecules are then hybridize in a thermal cycler. So we utilize a thermal cycler and we increase the temperature 96 to denature the DNA. Following this, we reduce the temperature to around 36 to basically anneal the DNA. So we do this about five or six times. And once the DNA basically undergoes this process, there will be bubbles wherever there is a mutation in the gene. So now this, enzyme cell nuclease will specifically cleave point mutations. And whenever you have a mutation, you will have more PCR cleavage products. Now this shows you an indication of what happens. So you have the mutated DNA alone. So this is the PCR product basically, which we amplified using a gene specific to Daniel radio. And this is the wild type PCR product. So both of these PCR products have been generated by using the same primers. And once you combine both these, this is a hybridized product. If you have a mutation, you will get a cleavage product. So this is basically the cleavage product. Now, if there was no cleavage product, it will indicate that there is no mutation. However, in this case, we obtain a cleavage product indicating that there is a mutation at that particular locus for that particular gene. Another way in which you can carry out studies on gene expression in zebrafish is by utilizing something known as morpholinos. Now, when you utilize a chemical mutagen, you are basically altering the genome. But what if you wanted to interfere or basically reduce the expression of the transcript? So this can be utilized by using a molecule known as a morpholino. So you should look at it this way. You have your gene expression in terms of the messenger RNA. And now as a researcher, you want to knock out certain RNA molecules. So what you do is you introduce a morpholino into the embryo by microinjection. And this morpholino is a molecule which will interact with the RNA. And if there is a silencing of that particular RNA, it will be reflected in the respective phenotype. OK, so now this approach is utilized in terms of the reverse genetics of the zebrafish. OK, now this is how a morpholino basically works. Now, when you have understood the process of RNA interference, as I've explained to you in the earlier lectures on RNA interference in the worm, you can basically silence RNA by utilizing a complementary strand of RNA. So you'll have a RNA positive and RNA negative. There will be interaction between these two RNA strands and the RNA interference machinery in the cell will basically result, lead to the degradation of these strands. Now in the case of morpholinos, what you do is you introduce a homologue or a complementary strand of RNA. 
But the thing about morpholinos is that their backbone is not composed of ribose sugar. The logic behind this is basically if you introduce an RNA molecule into a zebrafish embryo, the RNases, the enzymes within the embryo itself will destroy that RNA molecule. In order to reduce this, we create a morpholino. So a morpholino is basically a synthetic RNA which you synthesize and which you can utilize to basically silence other RNA molecules. Now, for instance, if you have an RNA which is involved in the formation of the mouth parts of the fish, a single RNA molecule, which may be a gene encoding the mouth part of the fish, and then you introduce a morpholino, which is an antisense to that particular gene, there will be an interaction between the transcript for the mouth part and the morpholino, and this will result in the loss of that particular transcript and the subsequent loss of the mouth part, which you can then visualize in this particular fish. Okay, so that's the way in which the morpholinos are utilized to study the interaction between two RNA molecules. Okay, now there is another way in which you can basically regulate RNA expression, and this is based by introducing synthetically capped mRNA. So you can inter introduce this RNA by microinjection into the embryo stage of the fish. And once this is introduced into the embryo, as the cells divide, the RNA molecules will be distributed more or less into every newly born cell of that particular embryo. So this is an mRNA-derived O expression, which is not cell-specific but it's a valuable tool for functional analysis by global expression of gain or loss function variants of a gene of interest. So now this is basically a method whereby you can introduce RNA into the first primordial cell. And as the embryo develops, this RNA is basically distributed throughout each and every cell. And this is basically going to target the other RNA molecules and you can also utilize it to study the gain of function, which means that you introduce an active RNA molecule into the embryonic cells, and you basically look at the expression of the phenotype in the, this particular cell line. Okay, so mRNA can be injected directly. So you can inject the cap RNA into the cells. You can inject the expression plasmid into the cell. Or you can also do a transposon directed mutagenesis of the cell. So you have probably studied these processes such as transposition in earlier lectures from different other courses. So transposition basically involves the injection of DNA, which integrates into the cell type. And plasmid expression basically involves the introduction of a plasmid with the expression system. So this plasmid will express in the cell and then the respective transcript will be translated in the cell type so you can also inject capped rna so this capped rna will then interfere with the cellular function so these are basically three methods by which you can control gene expression in the zebrafish developmental model Now, there have been a large number of studies using the transgenic fluorescent fish. And what is basically transgenic fluorescent fish? The gene of interest is fused to a reporter gene or placed upstream or downstream of a reporter gene. And the fluorescent protein can be utilized to indicate whether the, the gene of interest is being expressed or being basically downregulated. So because the green fluorescent protein can be measured, the optical signal can be measured using an optical device with a high level of accuracy, this can be utilized to measure the gene expression levels. So transgenic fluorescent fish have been utilized to study many aspects of developmental biology. And you can also use utilize them to study, for instance, the efficacy of certain drugs and therapeutic agents.
Now, in the fish, we also have certain transcription factors, which are the T box family of factors. So you have the T box proteins, which are required for the formation of the different genes encoding different structural elements. So these T box elements are required for early cell fate decisions. This primarily refers to the cell fate or the part into which a cell evolves. So the transcription factors are basically involved in regulating the formation of the body parts and the orientation of the cells, as well as the differentiation into, diff into organs. So the T-box is basically a T-box protein, which regulates other genes by binding to specific sequences within the genome. And T-box factors are very important in the study of developmental aspects of biology. OK, so these are some of the T-box elements and the way in which they interact with the DNA. So T-box elements have DNA binding domains, and they have functional domains, and they have repression domains. So, so now the DNA binding domain will bind to a specific gene, and it will repress or it will induce transcription. And they can either repress, as the red, red uh, legend indicates, or they can basically activate the expression of certain genes. So that brings us to the end of this particular module on the zebrafish. So to sum up, the zebrafish is an important model organism, which offers insights into the developmental biology of vertebrates and the ease of maintenance, short life cycle, and amenability to manipulation in vitro are useful characteristics which can be applied in forward and reverse genetics. So zebrafish is a very interesting developmental model which can be utilized in standard laboratories. You do not require much space in order to maintain zebrafish. They are very easy to maintain. The eggs are very easy to recover, and you can observe changes in the eggs using a conventional stereo microscope. These factors make it ideal for work in the laboratory. You can also carry out forward genetics experiments as well as reverse genetic experiments and perform mutations both at the level of the genome and study transcript expression by utilizing morpholinos and other RNA transcription mechanisms. So the reason why zebrafish is important in terms of its application to developmental biology is because it is the smallest vertebrate model which is available both in terms of the genome size as well as in terms of the actual size of the organism. It is easy to maintain in the laboratory and can be utilized for studies involving human developmental biology. With that, we end this particular lecture. Thank you very much for participating. If you have any questions, you may post them in the forum section of the learning management system. Thank you.